right, I guess I'm going to start. Um, I imagine more people will come in as lunch hour kind of builders away. Um, before I start, I know you just had lunch, most of you, so you're probably feeling that those after lunch blues, tired sleepiness. Um, I bought lots of swag with me, and I asked Johnny Long up here, the Google guy, to help me out, and he's going to basically throw t-shirts with the Airscanner logo at the people who look the most interested. So there's some incentive for you, and it's solely up to him who gets a t-shirt. Um, I'm going to, this talk is going to address a lot of security issues with uh, Windows Mobile environment, Windows CE, also known as Pocket PC, um, addressing it from the, a lot of different areas, just looking at it, taking it back to even Windows 95 day and seeing the comparisons, you'll understand what I mean when I'm done here. So let's get on. My name is Seth Fogey. I'm a VP for AirScanner. Uh, it's a mobile security company for Pocket PCs. We do mobile antivirus, mobile encryptor, and a firewall is forthcoming. I'm an author of several books, um, just contributed a couple chapters to Security Warrior. So if you're interested in the reverse engineering side of this, those chapter, the, there are a couple chapters in the book that address this pretty in-depthly. Um, Maximum Wireless Security, and I do work with InformIT.com for uh, their security section. But enough about me. Okay. Um, overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, the basic security issues. These are the things that have already been covered, that have been addressed, that you can go out there on Google or whatever and find papers for. So I'm just going to touch on them, make mention of them, and that's about it. Um, I'm going to talk about conceal a backdoor wizard, as I like to call it, and you'll understand what I mean when I get there. A keylogger. You can't have a platform without a keylogger, so I'll cover that. Reverse engineering overview, where I'm going to actually delve into reverse engineering on the ARM processor and lay down the fundamentals so you all can follow with me through how to create an invisible spy and a backdoor FTP server. Then we're going to look at the hard reset code, and this is the code that basically formats your PDA. Um, we're going to extract that code out and use it in a buffer overflow attack. Um, so you can see both how that code can be used and a buffer overflow attack and the obstacles I got to deal with to get that to work. Uh, we're also going to look at the WinC4 dust virus, which came out recently, and a couple other miscellaneous attacks, depending on time issues. If we run out of time, I might just address those quickly. So the basic security issues. Um, first, these things are pretty much completely lacking in security. Sure, you have the password. But the password itself is, by default, only four characters. It's not real strong. So there's no ACL. There's no encryption. You can access all the files on here. It's pretty simple to get into and control. You also have lost stolen issues, such as um, if you lose one of these PDAs, while well, all your information's on it, even if you like can't if you, uh, your PDA dies on you, if you store information in the internal folder that does not get deleted, you'll send that information in to the repair shop and there's no way you can get it out. Um, other issues like that. Biometric issues, some of these PDAs have biometrics built into it. There's papers out there that discuss all the security risks and how biometrics isn't always often as cracked up to be as what people say it is. There are Bluetooth and infrared issues. The Bluetooth virus came out three weeks ago that demonstrated Bluetooth can be used as a vector for viruses. Um, there's other Bluetooth things that have been discussed in the past about how Bluetooth can be used to be used and exploited. Wi-Fi issues, of course, that's been beaten to death. Um, Active Sync denial of service attacks, even because Active Sync runs on a default port, if you just type that port, well, you no longer have Active Sync. Along the same lines, these are susceptible to just a basic ping attack. If I ping this at one one thousandth of a second, this little guy will be so busy dealing with the ping request that it won't really be able to do anything else. Um, Forensics programs are available that you can quickly copy and extract all the information off of PDA, the RAM, and some of the ROM files as well. Um, there's also the hard reset and soft reset denial of service attacks that are quick, easy, painful ways for the end user. They'll basically lose control of their PDA and have to reset it themselves. And finally, there's also auto run on these things, which most people don't know about. But if you plug in a card such as this, I have two cards up here. This little card has a folder 2577, and inside that folder is an auto run program. That auto run program is actually just the soft reset program. So when I insert this, as you see, it does an instant soft reset. Now that can be taken, I mean, you can use your imagination on that, but if anybody wants to borrow my Atari Retro Games card, if, they put, if you put this in yours, it'll copy all the files out of my documents folder over to this card behind the scenes without you realizing it. Um, in addition to that, they're set as hidden, so you won't even know it. 
Now, another interesting thing about this, if you look, it should be resetting, there it goes again. And there's no card in there. The soft reset code stayed in memory enough so it could actually continue to soft reset. So the only way out of this is for me to do a manual hard reset, which would be really annoying if somebody borrowed your PDA on a bus and decided to slip a card in. Um, uh, ask Johnny to reset this guy. I'll need it later. Um, so the Trojan wrapper, also known as CabWiz. Uh, this came to Air Scanner's attention. Uh, it's in the references on the slides from a guy named Gerard. He pointed it out and said, look, this CabWiz, I mean, this, these CAB files can be you know, an easy way for somebody to get information on a PDA. And there's programs out there that actually take CAB files and dissect them and things like that. Well, I followed through in that thought and just went to the next step and followed it out. And you know, CabWiz is the perfect Trojan wrapper. It conceals all your files that you want to get on a PDA. It includes all the registry settings and any other, like, where you want to put the files on the PDA. It's self-extracting and self-executing, and it self-deletes, which is pretty much a Trojan wrapper. Um, and it's created by Microsoft, so it's guaranteed to work. <laughs> so it, the, you can go to MSDN and figure out how this thing works, but it's the perfect way to conceal a backdoor. That's why I call it, you know, the concealed backdoor wizard or concealed binary wizard if I toss that idea around, too. Um, so you can go there and figure out how it works, but it's a real simple way. And that's, I brought this up. It's not really technical. It's nothing really you know, advanced about this. But you can see how I would use this to get Trojans, key loggers, viruses, and other things onto a PDA quite easily. So it looks like Johnny's going to do. Are you going to throw a t-shirt out to somebody? <laughs> they don't travel very far. I thought about putting rocks in them, but I ran into issues with that before. So the keyboard logger, that big image scrolling on the right side or the left side, whatever it is, um, that's what a keyboard is on the PDA. It's basically nothing but a large bitmap. And with that bitmap is code to define which section of that keyboard is loaded and viewed on the screen. And in addition to that, you have code that's loaded to define an array as far as when you press this point on the keyboard, what letter is it supposed to write to the screen or character is it supposed to write to the screen. And also, it overlays it with an opposite image so it looks like you're pressing the keyboard. It's kind of pretty simple, but um, all this is packaged up inside a file called msim.dll. It's a core DLL file, so you can't really mess with that file itself. And this file is then configured with via registry settings to you know, define how it's going to look, when it's going to be loaded, and the default input method. So the challenges for a keyboard logger are, well, I'm going to have to create my own keyboard. Um, and it's going to have to be installable, and I'm going to have to be able to tweak the registry while I'm installing it to basically knock the other keyboard out and put this one in. So there are also other OS and OEM variations that you might have to think about, such as if you package it up for uh, CE3 and you put it on CE4, it might throw up a little box or something. Um, the creation of this, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be, but it still ended up being a little challenging. Programming CE.net includes a sample SIP numerical panel. Um, it includes a code for it. Also, the Platform Builder, which is a free 120-day download, I believe, includes a sample soft input, method, um, soft input panel as well. So you have working samples to start with, and you can use that and roll your own keyboard using better Visual C++ for, um, which is also a free download from Microsoft. So essentially, you have your SIP code, and then you just drop in a little tiny bit of code, and this is essentially all you need to do. Now, if you know, we have this file attribute hidden right here. And that means that when the file that you're logging the keystrokes to, it's hidden. So the user of the PDA will not stumble across it, will not realize it's there unless you're using a third-party program. Now for the registry settings. The default class ID is listed up there. And at that value, um, under that there's a key called is sip input method. If that's set at 1, it will be included as a keyboard. If set to 0, it won't. So I have to basically use a cab file or something to disable that from a 1 to a 0. Then I have that name, keyboard, which is free and clear now for me to use. So I borrow that and put it with my own class ID, and I set that is input method to 1. So now I've replaced it in the registry. There's also one other registry key you have to change, which is in the one that's listed there. And if I put my class ID in there, that's the default input method that's going to load. So I have a demo, because I like demos. I'm kind of suicidal like that. Um, here's a nice little screen. You can see what's going on in my PDA. So I'm going to install this little keyboard. Uh, keyboard logger. 
And you can see this is with a CAD file, and here it is. It's installing the files. That's all you'll see. Oh, I can name that keyboard.dll to anything and include it with other programs so you would not know what's going on. But I'm going to now make a new task. Call it Black Hat. How about something for originality? Hit OK. And you saw nothing out of the ordinary. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I forgot something here. Because when the thing loads, if I, I have to reset it to actually get it loaded. Now you can see my keyboard uh, is actually loaded here. I underlaid it with an AirScan logo so you can see the difference. So let me do a new one. Um, do and black. So you see no files here, but if we look under my mobile device and I go into Pocket PC, you can see there's this log file, that text that was created. Copy that out. I drop it in my Black Hat folder. And there you go. It worked. It's simple behind the scenes, easy execution, and everything's packed up and ready to go. So we have a key logger. Back to the presentation now. Um, it's practically invisible. The only way you're going to be able to see it is if you know what you're looking for in a debugger. And you're looking for a DLL that's loaded off device.exe. Now, I could be named any other name, and you'd have to really know what you're looking for to find it. Um, so, with that, knowing that, we're going to jump into reverse engineering. And we're going to talk about OS and hardware specifics. We're going to talk about some legal issues that I have to address, and reverse engineering tools and techniques, and ARM fundamentals. Um, so, here is a quick screenshot of what Windows CE is. For the most part, the memory is most important. You have the RAM, which stores all your registry, programs, databases. You have the ROM, which stores your core files. Now, some of these files are execute in place, which means that you can't get in there and debug them. Um, they run right from the ROM. So, when you try and debug it and you hit one of those, it'll drop your debugger. Uh, some of them, however, are compressed, and then when they get decompressed, they write to RAM, then run from RAM, and those you can debug. Something to keep in mind, especially if you're jumping into subroutines off of a program, because you don't want to just jump into one where you'll just, your debugger will die. Primarily, when you're reverse engineering, you're also going to be working with the graphics windowing event subsystem, the windows, what you interact at, what you, what you see, and from there, you can control things. Now the laws, and I'm just going to read this. No person shall circumvent a technological measure that effectively controls access to a work protected under this title. Um, this title being the law this came from. To circumvent a technological measure means to de-scramble a scramble work, decrypt an encrypted work, or otherwise avoid, bypass, remove, deactivate, or impair a technological measure without the authority of the copyright owner. In association with that, there's, you can also security test things by identifying and analyzing flaws and vulnerabilities of encryption technologies applied to copyrighted works and accessing a computer system solely for the purpose of investigating a security flaw or vulnerability. Now, the two programs I'm using here, I have permission to reverse engineer. And I got that, so I'm OK, and I'm just laying that out. If you want to reverse engineer them, you have to get your own permission. So the refer, refer, uh, prerequisites to reverse engineering. Oh, you got to understand what assembly is, where it runs, how it works, recognize it for what it is. You got to be able to convert hex to binary to ASCII to decimal. So if you understand what X, that X10 is greater than XC that is greater than 10, then you're off to a good start. Um, you got to understand the ARM processor, and that's what we're going to spend time discussing: the registers, how they work, and the opcodes, at least a large majority of them, so you can see how the code works. The register is just a simple place to hold memory, while the processor it uses that that value in the register to do its processing. Um, we're going to pay attention to register 15 to register 0. There are 37 total, but most of those aren't important for what we're dealing with here. Um, register 15 is your program counter. It's the value that is the, is the next execution. The link register holds a subroutine return address. So program's executing. If it hits a subroutine, it's got to know where to return. That's what the link register is for. It points back. The stack pointer points to being used by your processor, being used by the program. And the status flags, uh, negative less than, zero equal, carry, borrow, extend. These are the three that you'll see the most often, and we'll discuss these in a second here. This is a screenshot so you can see from a debugger how the registers look. Register zero through register 12, get my highlighter, they're pretty much all laid out there nice and easy. Um, your stack pointer is right here, your link register is right here, and your program counter is right here. And then here are your flags. Your flags control 
how your program executes. The opcodes. Move is probably one of the more common ones. This simply moves a hard-coded value into a register or a register value into a register. I included some sample hex up here so you can see for yourself how it looks. Um, when I play with this, I pretty much play with it on the hex level, so I kind of get to familiar with how these things look, and you spend enough time with it, you can too. Note the red highlighted uh, one in three. That's the difference between a hard-coded value and a register being moved into another register. It's important to note that because if you mess it up and you forget it or you don't notice it, you'll go off and you'll things won't work the way they're supposed to. Um, the compare opcode. Uh, this compares a hard coded value to a register or a register to a register. Again, the same hex is included with the same highlighted characters. Now, the compare opcode doesn't actually move any data or do anything to the registers, but it does update your status flags. So, it compares the register to it compares two registers, two values, and depending on whether they're greater than, equal, or um, greater than, less than, or equal, it'll update your status flags. The N status flag will be set if R1 is greater than R0. The Z status flag, which is your equal, will be set if R0 equals R1. And the carry is the opposite of the N. Now you see moves and the ANDs opcode are listed there as well. Note that S on the end. That S means you have a status flag update after the opcode is performed. So the resultant value determines your flag conditions. In the case of moving R1 into R0, if R0 is negative, the N status flag is set to 1. If the R0 is equal to 0, the Z status flag is equal to 1. And C just doesn't really do anything here. Um, again, the more you spend time with this, the more familiar you'll be with it. So we're going to continue on here. When the status flag is set, it's used for uh, controlling the flow of the program. EQ is, uh, is when the Z is set to equal. NE is when the Z is set to not equal, and so on and so forth. So you end up using it in conditions like this, where you have a branch. Now, if nothing, no status is, is considered important here, it'll just branch out to another part of the code when it hits this opcode. However, if the BEQ opcode is used, then it will only branch if the equal status flag is set. Same thing for not equal and for the, the less than. And the same thing with branch with link. It branches, the branch with link, it branches down, it branches out, don't, runs the subroutine usually, and then branches back to the parent thread. Um, so, here you see, again, a little bit of hex included and different vari variations in how they look. This opcode is really important. You're loading register and storing register. So, you're loading a register with a value and you're storing a, um, with it from memory or you're storing a value in the register up to memory. Lots of different variations on how this can be used. The load M and the STM, or the load multiple and the store multiple are used most often when you have a subroutine. Because if you call a subroutine, you got all these values in the registers that you got to store somewhere, so you put them on a stack. And that's why you see that stack pointer listed there. And when the subroutine's finished, it's got to take all those values off the stack and put them back in the register so the program knows where to operate and keep going. We're also going to see uh, store byte, which has its, its opposite is load byte. And that just simply changes one byte in memory. So the, that's a real brief, quick outline of reverse engineering um, as far as the uh, ops codes and registers. Now, you need tools in order to do this. You need a hex editor because if you're going to do it at the hex level, you got to be able to get in there and tweak the hex. And I use Ultra Edit 32 here. Everybody has their favorite. There's many out there that are free. A disassembler is essential. It converts a program from its hex form into readable and understandable assembly code. And IDA Pro does this, does it well. It's the industry standard for it pretty much. You also need a debugger, so you can work through the program live. You can see how it's working. You can see what values are being passed around. If you're going to do a lot of it, don't use the USB connection. Use a program called Pocket Host with a network connection. And then using that, you can pretty much get real-time execution and walkthrough of code. Again, Microsoft Embedded Visual Studio C++ 3 if you're doing 2002, or um, 4 if you're doing 2003 Windows, or I should say WinCE 3 or WinCE 4, depending on which one you're using. So, all this, we're going to talk about the invisible spy. And you already saw me use one program up here, so you could see what was going on on my screen. Now, that's a legit program uh, called Virtual CE. It runs much like a VNC does, so I can control and see what's going on in my PDA. Standard installer, registry settings, it lists in the program file. But what if I don't want it to be visible? Well, the visible part of this is when the window is created. So when you initiate the program first, it's going to pop up a window. And then that window, you basically adjust your settings and you hit OK. 
Now, if I don't want it to be visible, well, I need to do something with that create window function. I can't delete it because it is used at other times throughout the program. But here is the create window function, and you see all the parameters that are passed to it. Now, of interest is the one called DW style, which determines whether a window starts to maximize, minimize, pop up, or visible, or et cetera, goes on. The, the mode it shows up initially. Um, now, when you're programming, it's nice to type in WS maximize, but that's not going to show up in IDA. It's not going to recognize that. So you need to look at your header fire file and see what these values are converted to. And you can see the list right there. And so we're probably looking for something in that list. So the general reverse engineering process goes like this. You've got to load it into this assembler, locate the needed files. There might be some included DLL files you need to link in. Um, note the names of the functions that you're looking for. Create window is what we're looking for, but you could looking for a message box if you're looking for a pop-up or you know, string compare, string length check. And then you find the target and you figure out what's going on. So I have IDA loaded up here. And here's my names window. And I know exactly what I'm looking for, so I've already got it prepared. Here's create window EX and with an address located right next to it. If I simply double click on that, it takes me right to the location in the program that create window is called from. Now here is a list of all the locations that of all the addresses that call create window. I'm just going to start with the first one because I've already done this and I know that's where I need to go. So here is where that function is first called. Now you can see we have our one, register one, register two being loaded with two text values. Virtual CE is loaded into R2 and V remote is loaded into R1. Now if I take a look back at my PowerPoint presentation, you can see that here's the class name and here's the window name. So I'm guessing R3 is probably going to hold my style because those two values look like they were class names and uh, a, uh, a window name. Oh, back over to IDA. R3, well, here we go. Listed right there. Now, if I compare that to what's on my slides, you can see that that is visible. That's what that value equals. So I know how it's being loaded. So now. I can probably follow that through and say, well, I don't want to start this visible. I want to start it minimized. And if I do start it minimized, then you kind of have to do a trial and error here. But uh, essentially, when you start it minimized, it doesn't show up. But it does show up later. And when it shows up is right down here when it shows the window and updates the window. So those two values I need to do something with. And in the case of creating the window, I can't just knob it out and forget about it. But I probably could do that here. The only situation is, is that there is no true NOP on a ARM processor. Uh, if x86, people are familiar with that, it's 090 or x90. Um, I plugged that in for grins and giggles one time and it came up being an unsigned uh, multiple long with status check. And that's about as far from a non-op as you can get. So I need an op code that does nothing. Move R0 into R0. That moves the value of register into itself. It does absolutely nothing. It doesn't update status. It doesn't really move any values. Ironically, IDA recognized it as an op. So I, it kind of you know, lets you know you're on the right track. Um, so here's an overview of what I'm going to want to do. I have minimize right here at this address. And this is the, the original, and I want to change it to this. Then this is the hex right here that it was, and this is what I'm going to want to change it to. And out of that, there's a two value right there. Um, same thing with show window, except this time I'm going to want to change the hex from this to that. And down here we have the update window, and I want to update the hex from uh, the original to my not string, or a not command. Um, so to do that, I need a hex editor. And this address right here is where I need to go in my hex editor. You can see at the bottom of IDA, when I go to create window, and right here is where the value is plugged in. Right here is my address. That's the address. It's, a, it's a, the absolute address, because if you're not worrying about you know, the original offset, then that's where it's going to be. But it's not the address you're going to look for in a hex editor. That address is right down here, 150C. So I go to my hex editor, and I pull up, I scroll down to 150C, and this is what I'm looking for. So right there is my opcode. I change that one to a two, and that opcode is taken care of. Then uh, jump back over to here, 159C and 15A4. 159C, 00000A0E1, 
N15A4, 000 A0E1. Now I'm going to save this file, save as, V Remote 2, save, copy this guy from my virtual remote and put it on my PDA. And it's on the PDA now. So I'm going to let you see this. This is the program. And there's one little nice feature about this that I didn't talk about yet. But here's the program. I'm going to, uh, let's see, close. I'm going to exit out of this program. I'm going to settings, system, memory, running programs, virtual CE, stop. So it has stopped. The screen went away. Now if I jump back up to my root directory, I have virtual remote. I click on that. Hey, look at that. It even has a built-in notification system. So I can put this on a PDA in my network or somebody's network, and it's going to tell me when that person comes online. If I click connect, well, I have full remote control access. I can control the PDA and I can see what's going on. And the PDA user does not know. There is no way to tell unless you get a program that's not included with the PDA. You've got to use an alternate program to find out this. So you get full hidden remote viewing, alerting feature, and it can easily be placed in the Windows startup folder. Since most PDA users, users don't even know they have a startup folder, it's a very easy place to hide things. You can only stop it really with a firewall um, or by monitoring the running processes. Since it's not really a true virus, antivirus is essentially useless. Um, so we have full, control ac full remote control, but what about file access? Well, an FTP server makes that pretty easy. So I went out and looked for an FTP server, and I found one. And this FTP server gave me a head start because it had no authentication system, didn't show up in the program memory listing already. Or it gives me full access to PDA files, but it does have that little visible icon. Now, you saw the process the first time. I'm not going to go through it again. But shell notify icon is what we're looking for. Um, the, in this case, what we need to look at is DW message, which is right here. And that is add, modify, or delete, which again, looking at the header file, is 0, 1, or 2. So I know what I'm looking for. I will show you in IDA how it looks. Uh, OK, let me jump up to my FTP server, click that. What existing, again, we have our names. I want to sort it, then scroll up to show notify icon. Close that. And here we see one. And moving zero into R0, you have show notify icon. So looking down further, we have moving two into R0 before the shell notify icon function is called. Looking back at our PowerPoint, well, zero adds it, two deletes it. So guess what we're just going to do? Knop it out. And it's as simple as that. Once you knop it out, the icon goes away. You can also change the port so it doesn't make it really painfully obvious. You've got to hit an FTP server running on the network. And once you do that, you get a full hidden remote access, which again can be easily placed in the Windows startup folder. Firewall can stop it. You can monitor running processes, but it's not really true virus, so you can't really detect it with that. Uh, and you can even access it in Internet Explorer. Port 45, enter. So here I have full remote access to all the PDA files. And you can see my SD cards listed right there and my Windows folder. I mean, whatever you want. The whole thing's there laid out nice briefly, nice for me. Um, so we've got full remote access, full visible access, full remote control. But what about the malicious attacks? Well, let's look at this hard reset code. If you compile this code right here, you will have a hard reset program. And that program, basically, when you execute it, it will format the PDA, such as what you saw I had to do when I clicked the buttons in my PDA reset and I gave it to Johnny. Um, two things to note here. This is really the core part right here. Set clean reboot flag. That is the first part because it set the flag inside the PDA that tells the PDA, hey, the next time this thing's reset, I need a format. Then this part here actually does the reset or the reboot. When the thing is reboot, it checks to see if this flag is set. If it's not set, it does a soft reset, which is essentially like rebooting a computer. If it is set, well, then it resets the device. So knowing that, let's disassemble it. And here we go. You put that set clean boot re reboot flag into R0. Uh, that's the address of the set clean, re set clean reboot flag. You then work through it, and eventually you call it right here, where it's loaded in the program counter. Once it's loaded in there, it's going to be called, and it's going to set that flag. It passes control back out to my program, puts a bunch of values in, sets the values as null, and then it loads up R0 with that 
IO control how reboot. And that's the value that basically tells the kernel IO control that this is a reboot coming up. Then we load up the address into R4 for the kernel IO control and work down through it and you know eventually load RO, uh, you, you load the program counter with the kernel IO control function call. Since that flag is ret set, it's going to reboot. If that flag, uh, well, we'll get to that a little bit later. So what can be done with this? Now, I got some really short, concise, nasty code here. What can somebody do with it? Well, I started thinking about a buffer overflow attack. FTP servers are probably one of the most popular places you can get a buffer overflow attack on. So I started poking around in this FTP server program. And just by even doing make directory and CD and things like that, it, it was easy to see that this program was susceptible to buffer overflow attack. Except that gave me that null character because it's Unicode. So I had to look a little bit deeper and I went to the raw FTP commands. And sure enough, these commands were definitely vulnerable to a buffer overflow attack, where I had full control over the program counter or the return address, essentially, and I could redirect the PDA's processor to my own code. So using a standard smack stash overflow, I essentially load my code onto the stack, point the program counter to my code, and it executes my code. So I'm going to inject this basically into a, my PDA using a buffer overflow attack. And I'm not supposed to forget to reset the PDA as you can tell there on the screen. So I'm going to reset this and go to the next slide. So I'm going to walk through here and show you how this code actually gets put onto the stack, how you control the stack, and then I'm going to overflow the stack so you can see it happening. And then we'll actually run the buffer overflow. Okay, that's up. And that's up. So I'm using my Microsoft Embedded Visual Studio. I'm going to open up my FTP server program, which is right here. And this is going to run the program essentially on my PDA, because it copies it down to the PDA, but it'll allow me to debug it while I'm working on it. Uh, every now and then, this gives me quirky errors, but it looks like we're going through. It connects. It, here we go. Do, do, do. All right, it's up. Now you can see this is the memory screen right here. This is so I can look actually inside the RAM that's running on my PDA and see what value is being passed in and out of the RAM. The RAM. Down here are all the registers. I already showed you that screenshot so you're at least a little familiar with how it will look. And I'm going to watch this to see what values are being passed in and out and also my, um, my condition flags to see how the program is going to execute. So that said, let me hit F5 here. I'm going to jump over to my command prompt and I'm going to FTP to what I hope is the address, which it should be because, oh, no, I don't want FTP, sorry. I want Telnet to it so I can actually look at the commands. Port 21, hit enter. You see my banner pop up right away. Now I'm going to set a breakpoint on my debugger. And I already have this programmed in here because I know what I'm looking for. Hit OK. Make sure that is indeed set, and it is. I'm going to hit a 5 again, and now I'm going to send this a lot of A's. <laughs> and I think that's enough. So now I'm going to hit enter, and hopefully, oh, it sometimes does this. Throws a fatal exception. Let me reload this then. These live demonstrations always have a tendency to do funny things. Five. Tell that to it again. Send a bunch of A's. Okay. So now my breakpoint caught it. So what I need to do is look on my stack. And I want to see what happens. And I place my stack address basically in, I place my stack value, the stack pointer, right up into my address screen. And we're going to walk through this program. And basically, I'm going to jump right down to this point in the program. So run the cursor. A bunch of values moved around the register. That's why they're red. Now, if we take this program, and we're at 12 FAC, and I look over here, and I go to um, 12 F, oops. 
12 FAC, you see I already labeled out that this is the point where the stack is overwritten. And it's a string copy command. And uh, so we have a copy. It basically occurs, as you'll see, you send it a really large value. The value is passed into the program. The program, for some reason, you know, looks at that value and says, well, this isn't a recognized command. I don't know what this is. It then says command not recognized, and it sends it, puts it on the stack. Then it calls the next function where it's going to send it back to you. Well, when it puts it on the stack, it's overwriting everything on the stack. So here I'm going to jump down to this next line, and you'll see that my stack was just overwritten, that all of these 61s are now placed on a stack. And I've essentially, once I hit, come down a few more lines here, this is where the function's returned uh, back to the parent thread. So if I hit F11, it's going to air out, throw me an exception, and here you can see the 61s, just like that, are on the stack. So I know that I gain control of the stack pointer, I mean, the program counter. So back over to here. So we got control. Now what code am I going to throw on it? Well, the abridged code for the hard reset isn't going to work because it includes a few of those 00, zero null bytes. And those are going to basically stop the code at the point and it won't execute anymore. Now there's no XORing on the ARM, which is the first place I, you know, okay, we're going to try that. But then there is the AND. So I can, if I can get a value 1 into a register, then I can use that value 1, perform an AND operation, and basically make sure that my, why well, don't you have to put a 1, well, I had to put a 1 because I can't send any zeros, so, um, put the value 1, perform an AND operation against, basically you can see it right here, that AND with that is going to equal 0. AND looks at 2 by, it's a binary check where it looks at one binary string gets another binary string, it follows down through, if two of the values are 1's, it will result in a 1, Otherwise, the rest will be zeros. So none of these line up, and that means the resultant value is zero. So now I was able to get zero onto into a register that I controlled. Now, once I had one in there, and I'm sorry, well, I was able to get zero into a register I controlled. So once I got zero into there, then I could just simply use a store byte routine and go back through and basically change all the values I needed that were originally switched switched to a one back to a zero. So I start with my uh, my my code, I switch it to a 1, I inject it, inside my code that I inject, I define a value as 1, I perform an AND operation, get a register to equal 0, and then I store that 0 and basically unencrypt kind of um, my code. So it ends up being what I want it to be. And here is the entire code that I had to come up with in order to do this. Here, up here, up here you can see I'm moving, R, moving 1 in R1. I'm moving, uh, I'm performing an AND operation, getting R1 to equal 0, and then I follow through with a bunch of store byte routines and a bunch of different offsets, where I go through and I flip each of these ones to a 0. Flip, 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 flip. Now, down here, there are two red values, and these are important because I hard-coded these for my buffer overflow attack. Um, however, that each buffer overflow attack for this particular case, these this uh, value, the 30... I'm sorry, the F74F74, that's the address to the subroutine, the function of set clean, set clean reboot flag. So that's the address that calls that, that has that uh, flag set. The number 27 is where the hard reset code, uh, the kernel IO control is called, and that's when it checks the, when well, that reboot flag was set, and it takes the IO control how reboot value, and it then performs the reset, hard reset or soft reset, depending on whether or not that flag has been set. These are hard coded for this particular device. They change. On this device, they are different. And we'll talk a little bit more about that particular issue in a bit here when I talk about the virus. But know that and understand that this is the static value you have to use. So going on, I have a demo. And I'm going to unplug my power, which is fine. And there's one other issue about this demo. Since you are operating, I'm going to stop this. Since you are operating with that, uh, the offset address, that offset address is not static. So the first two values, that 22 or whatever it is that you, that the IDA does not include, these two characters right here, you have to know those ahead of time. And this is a proof of concept, but generally you can guess it. Between 18 and 24 is where it's going to fall. Um, so I need to know that value ahead of time. Since it's not running on here, let me run it. I'm going to start up the FTP server on this device. 
The device is now running FTP server. I go to tools, I go to remote process viewer, I wait, and as sometimes happens too, I gotta close out of the EVC before I can go back in there and do it again. Now I go to tools, process viewer, pocket PC device, and it loads up. Here's my list of processes that are running. Scroll down, here's my FTP server, and you can see the base address is 22 in this case. So using this program that I coded up for, I was gonna do it wireless, but I don't wanna put my demonstration at the risk of being knocked offline by somebody with other intentions. Uh, PDA exploit 190.200.1.50. Actually, let me just make sure. You can see I even listed here, if you can read that, that I have my Dell 5X and my Dell X30, so there are different offsets there. Port 21, the offset in this case, I believe, was 22. Yes, so the offset is 22, and the device is the 5X. So hit one, and here is do or die time. So this device, upon hitting enter, it should reset. And it's worked every time so far, so I hope it works now. Uh, I'm gonna hit enter here. Uh, you know what, if I typed it right. <laughs> okay, once again, here's the device, and so it should reset if I hit enter here. Hit enter, it's now doing its thing, and I wait for a few seconds, which isn't abnormal. And it will say package sent. Come on. Okay, so you saw it reset. And you're gonna hear the proverbial da ding, which basically means this device just performed a hard reset. The user's device would have lost all their data except for the stuff that's stored on the SD cards. But it would have wiped all the programs out, would have wiped the my documents folder out, it would have wiped all that out. Da ding. So that's the noise I like to hear when I'm doing this. Um, back to my presentation now. Again, the values aren't static. The FTP server program will always crash because you'll always gain control of the, pro the, the, the stack, I mean the program counter. Um, if you know the offset, then you can perform the PDA over exploit, uh, the buffer overflow attack quite well, actually the, the hard recode. Um, now I just did hard recode because it was quick, easy, and painless, but I gain control of the stack. I can pretty much put whatever I want in there. I can do file deletes. I could do uh, registry changes. I could do, um, I mean, pretty much whatever I wanted to, uh, just as long as I had the right offset, the right memory address for the function I wanted to access. So that function, let's, have you all heard of this virus? It came out a week and a half ago. Yes, hands, raise, yes. Okay, we've heard of this virus. This is a Windows CE dust virus, or DUTS virus, depending if you're an antivirus, some antivirus companies. Um, this was coded in assembler language for the ARM. The guy actually hand coded the thing in assembler. Uh, man, your aim is pretty bad. Um, so it's about, it's 1,536 bytes that are appended to the file, the file that is infected. It asks if it might be installed, if it may install, which just makes it one of the more polite viruses out there. It does actually obey the user and that you say yes or no, it won't, it will or won't infect uh, likewise. Um, it only infects in the root directory. It will infect only files greater than 4K. Um, it does also play with the, the header. <coughs> so the virus code is run initially before it actually bounces back into the original program and then the original program will execute. Now, this virus, most people consider it pretty innocent. You know, it didn't do anything. It's a polite virus. It doesn't, you know, it hasn't really made any differences as far as the virus world goes. But after looking at this code, looking at the virus, seeing how it works, what this virus writer did was pretty creative. Um, on the PDA, uh, you saw with the hard reset there, I had to have that value, that, that, that memory address in order to call set cleat ring boot flag. Well, this virus writer, he hard coded this thing in assembler, so he didn't import any DLLs, he didn't you know, do anything like that, so he had access to those subroutines somehow, right? So how did he gain control of those subroutines? Well, he came up with this interesting way, he found one value, k data struct, that was 
uh, used, it's used in the PDA, using that value, which is static for all the platforms, all environments for Windows CE, he was able to iterate through all the DLLs, find the address for a DLL, then use the export value, and he was able to understand, he knew what export value he was looking for, for the functions, and he was able to basically dynamically look through the DLL file, find that function number, link it to an address. So he had access to things like uh, close handle, open handle, uh, malloc, um, you know, create file for mapping, things like that, message box, just like the screenshot here says. So he had access to all those DLLs. Now, that makes this virus a little bit more important because he basically laid down the foundation to easily, and I mean really easily, create a whole new type of virus for the Windows CE platform that you don't need to know the hard code about it, it'll figure it out on its own. Um, so he laid out access to find access, he laid out the foundation to find access to any DLL first, so he can link into any of the DLLs. He also laid out the foundation for dynamic core DLL file access. How am I doing time here? Okay. Um, with the core DLL, the core DLL is an important file because it is the file that contains all the major functions that you're going to want to access to, such as the ones I already read out. But what if you went in there and you wanted to delete a file? Could you get access to that function? And maybe set clean reboot flag <coughs> with the kernel out of control. Or kill all the threads, or power off system, or access the registry, or delete file. I mean, you name it, it's pretty much available. So, I got to reset this guy real quick. You know what, Johnny? I gave you the wrong one, but that's all right. Um, let me run through this here and reset this guy back up to the screen. So, knowing this, I wanted to see what else this virus is capable of. So, I went in and I basically tweaked it up a little bit. And I wanted to have, to have a proof of concept. And I mean, this virus was only released last week. So in, in that time, I was able to easily figure out what was going on, figure out how the file access was taken care of, uh, figure out how the, the function call access was taken care of. And I altered his code to make it a little bit more of a real proof of concept, which I'm only keeping internal. I'm not sharing with anybody. Um, I'm going to open up VX or virtual remote again. Yeah. What's your first name? <laughs> first name. <laughs> okay, so are we all looking at my screen here? We are. So I'm going to get this virus out. I'm copying out three files an FTP server program. Pocket IRC, which was one of the virus files that he included with the program, and Pocket TTY. Um, then I'm going to take my copy, copy out the directory. So I just wanted to see how much I could pack into this virus. And I didn't make the virus any different. I just basically ripped out all his comments and put my own code in. And then in a particular spot in the program, I branched it out to my code and did a couple checks. At first, I checked to see if the file was greater than 300K. If it was, then I set the cleat ring boot flag. That's all I did. I didn't reset it. I just set that flag. If the file is greater than 100K, well, at first, if it, it set that flag, then it bounced back into the program of the virus, runs through the virus routine, infects the files in the other folder, and continues on. I then did another little thing, so it would check if it was greater than 100. And if it was greater than 100K, it would delete the file. So here you can see I have a FTP server program that's not infected. It's 19.5K, <coughs> pocket IRC, which falls into that greater 100 category, but less than 300 category, and pocket TTY, which falls into the greater than 300 category. So when I run this FTP server program, you can see that the FTP server was up, was infected, pocket TTY final was infected, and that 100K was deleted. And this didn't take a whole lot of work, which is why this virus is actually more of a threat than I, people, than I think people realize. Now, when I said I set the, cl the, the clean reboot flag, um, what that essentially did is made this a ticking time bomb. Because how, well, somebody give me an idea, how often do you like reboot your PDA? Like just a regular reboot? Anybody? A couple times a week? You couple, well, you're 